Welcome to Beyond Blessed, where I post Christian inspirational messages that I hope will guide you to a closer relationship with God. I post daily messages of inspiration. If you find value in this channel, please be sure to like and subscribe as it helps the channel grow. Today we are talking about the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter is writing to Christians who are being persecuted and exiled, and they are about to face Nero's full wrath. Who will lash out and rage at them? Does Peter begin with tears of despair over their situation? Absolutely not. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He begins with a triumphant prayer. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, He has given us new birth into a living hope in His great mercy. Circumstances cannot shake Peter's faith in Christ. In the first three verses, he mentions Christ four times. His faith is in a God rather than in religion. His hope is not a lifeless clump of clay that will disintegrate in the rains of persecution. It is a solid rock that will withstand the flood of persecution. That is why he begins like a volcano, erupting with praise and gratitude to God. We can learn from Peter that if we begin with God and His grace rather than the gutter and our complaints, we will be successful. With heavenly praise, we can face even hellish persecution. The key to heavenly hope is to start above the clouds where you can see the sun shining. Then you can come down and face life's problems, but if you start with the problems, you'll get bogged down and never see beyond the clouds. Because of the weight of your trials, you are unable to rise above them, and hope begins to fade. Hope is like a watch's mainspring. When it fails, the watch no longer serves its purpose, and if hope is lost, so is the meaning and purpose of life. Hope is a requirement, not a luxury. We want to look at Peter's message in these first verses to see why he is so full of hope, and see what the results will be if we rely on those reasons. In verses 2 and 3, According to Peter, we must always be prepared to give a reason for our hope. All of the reasons for our hope can be found in God, not in ourselves. God's love is what prompts, His grace is what provides, and His power is what perfects. Because they all begin with man and work their way up to God, no great philosophy has ever satisfied the hearts of men. However, the Bible begins with God and works its way down to man. The only reason for having any hope is because of God's salvation plan. Long before we existed, the entire Godhead was working on our behalf. Jesus purchased our redemption on the cross, and the Holy Spirit applied that redemption and sanctifies us. You may wonder how you know you are one of the elect. Everyone who comes to God is elect, because no one who comes will be rejected. If a person does not accept salvation, they are condemned to hell and are not among the elect. Those who do come to the Lord have hope because Jesus has already accomplished everything necessary for their salvation. A former governor of Massachusetts had three friends who went to the Holy Land. They climbed Golgotha and brought back a stick to use as a cane as a gift for the governor. We wanted you to know that when we stood on Calvary, we thought of you, they said. He thanked his friends for the gift, but added, but I am even more grateful that there was another one who thought of me there. He placed his faith in Jesus Christ's finished work. We see in verse 3 the strongest reason for our hope is in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Without a living Savior, the cross could not bring a living hope. The fundamental truth of the Gospels is that Jesus rose from the dead, and it is not a fanciful fiction. It is the rock upon which we place our hope. Without it, we would be without hope, just like the heathens. In the first Corinthian letter, Paul stated that if Christ had not risen, then our faith would be in vain. A king once prepared a horrifying form of torture for one of his adversaries. The man was arrested and thrown in a cell with nine windows on one side. The man thought this was not so bad, but at midnight a trumpet blared and a crashing noise woke him up. There were only eight windows left when he woke up. The terrifying reality hit him when the same thing occurred the following night, and there were only seven windows left. He was in a cell with a clock-driven moving wall. Every evening, it made one-ninth of the way to the opposite wall. He would be pinned between the walls at midnight on the ninth day. 
This is a representation of those who are hopeless. Paul says that such is the condition of the man who does not believe in the resurrection. Peter was aware of this from his own experiences with hopelessness. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter had made one final attempt to save Jesus, but Jesus rebuked him and surrendered himself to be put on trial. Afterwards, Peter lost hope. Peter later denied ever having met Jesus. Peter tried to put the crucifixion behind him and returned to fishing because his hopes had been dashed. However, if you read the book of Acts, you will find Peter preaching to thousands on the day of Pentecost. You see him boldly addressing the Sanhedrin and proclaiming that the same Jesus who was crucified is alive and resurrected. Every sermon he preached emphasized the resurrection as the reason for living hope. The early church turned the world upside down by the truth and the power of his resurrection. We are born again into salvation and hope through faith in our resurrected Lord. If we believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead, we will be saved and will have hope and eternal life. In verses 5 through 8 we find that hope is based on the past, but it also looks ahead and influences the present. Hope brings forth some of the blessings that we are promised in eternity into our present time. One of these blessings is the promise that God will not allow us to be tested beyond our capacity. Even in adversity, we need to rejoice and we need to praise Him. We are kept by God's power through faith. Kept is a military term that means guarded. When Damascus governor kept the city with a garrison, he used this word. Faith is the bugle that summons troops to surround the fort. In the midst of tribulations and trials, we also see hope and joy because our faith and hope in God surrounds and protects us. The children of God will be persecuted, but we must rejoice and be glad in anticipation of our heavenly reward. When we face tribulations as Christians, we should be encouraged and remain calm because our Lord Jesus has already overcome the world. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 10, As sorrowful yet always rejoicing, this is not double talk. Rather, it is the confidence and courage that we as children of God can have as a result of our faith and hope in Him. We are to know and understand that our suffering is only for a season, but our salvation is eternal. Our difficulties and persecutions is only a brief pause before continuing on into eternal life. Persecutions have always bolstered the faith of Christians whose hope is firmly planted in Jesus Christ. Trials and testing helps us grow in our faith because it removes everything superficial. When life is too easy, we tend to put our faith in material things instead of the Lord. God helps us to be wary of making comforts the goal of our lives. A little heaviness and sorrow sometimes does us good, for it reveals to us what is real and what our hope should be. When we turn to Jesus in our trials, we will have hope and our hope will turn our heart aches into rejoicing and our sorrows into songs. We can have happiness in the midst of heartache when we have hope in Christ. Peter encourages us to consider our trials just a passing thing, and even if the sky should fall it could do no more than purify us if we stand fast in our relationship with the Lord. In verse 8 he says, that our hope in Christ should produce in each of us such a joy that it cannot be expressed with words. If we attempt to voice it, the words will almost always come out sounding superficial because we don't have the words to express just how amazing it really is. Someone once said, True joy is a thing which dwells more in the heart than in the face and on the tongue. Sometimes silence is the most profound way to express our joy. This is especially true in times of trial. To try and express your joy in Christ when you are suffering affliction will most likely sound superficial. For man to be happy, he must have three things. Something to do, something to love, and something to look forward to. The third is lacking in the hearts of people who have turned away from or who have never turned to the Lord. There are men of strong disposition who by grit and sheer will power make it through the stormy seas of life without losing hope. But when they reach the harbor of death, their ship sinks like a stone, and all of that grit and determination was in vain. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 7 says, 
When the wicked die, his hope perishes. Workmen discovered a dungeon beneath an old castle ruin in Scotland, and when they entered the dark and damp cell, they saw scratched on the wall, no hope, no hope. This is never the cry of the believers of God, for his hope is eternal, and it does not fade away even in a dungeon. Ever since Paul and Silas were locked away in a dungeon, there have been songs in the night coming from the tongues of those whose hope is in Jesus Christ. Our inheritance in Christ is both permanent and pure. The beauty of the earth fades away. The colored leaves that soothe the eye are soon faded and dry. They are soon only good for the fire. But we look for an inheritance where the beauty and delight never fades. There is no more pain or crying. There is no more death or dying. As for sorrow and for sighing, these two shall fly away. Verse 9 tells us of the ultimate reward of our faith, which is the salvation of our soul. Faith and hope are the two rudders by which God guides our ship of grace down the river of His redeeming love to the sea of salvation. If anyone is not on that ship now, make haste to get aboard for the tickets are free, and all are welcome. The only request the captain of our salvation makes is that you confess your sins, accept his death on your behalf, and commit your life to him. In him alone is there a hope that can take you through all of life's trials with joy and the promise of eternal life. When Jesus returns, will you be standing steadfast in your faith and showing the world your confidence in him? Or will we be running around like chicken little for fear that more than the sky will fall on you? Comment below your thoughts on the subject. And as always, remember, stay blessed.